I wish to send a greeting to my friends and colleagues here. I'm just sorry that I cannot be there in person to present today. The title of my talk is Hypoglycemia, Technology Alone is Not Enough to Solve the Problem. Right. And I'm giving this talk on behalf of both my hospital and the University of Sheffield and also the International Hypoglycemia Study Group I have the honor to chair and to invite colleagues watching to join us. Go onto our website, which is Google, you'll see that we are welcoming new members, particularly from India. These are my disclosures. This is the outline of my presentation. I'm going to talk about hypoglycemia and in particular impaired awareness, which predicts people at major risk. And that's true for both individuals with type 1 and or type 2 diabetes. I want to explain how we measure both and uh, consider the significance. And then uh, address the question of which interventions can provide useful treatment. I'm like briefly going to mention insulins, technology, and education. But I want to start and reminding you that hypoglycemia remains a huge issue. The belief among some people that with technology, uh, then hypoglycemia will be a problem of the past. And I'm afraid that is not the case. And until we can make fundamental difference in treatment to both conditions, hypoglycemia sadly will be with us. Uh, and to emphasize the point, I want to draw your attention to these quite recent data that were conducted in North America. In the USA spends more money on healthcare than any other country in the world. Uh, it's called the INFORM study. It still remains a data which is presented only in abstract form, but I'm told the final manuscript is in the final stages of preparation. And these American investigation, investigators, led by Stuart Harris from London in Ontario, Canada, uh, did a survey of hypoglycemia. I'm going to just show you the results of severe events described as cognitive impairment requiring the help of another person. Uh, and these are baseline results because they're going to look effectively, and I think after intervention. So let's look at severe hypoglycemia expressed as the number of events per person per year. And you can see that, uh, overall the combined data in light blue, very high. If we look at type 1 diabetes, 3.5 episodes per person per year on average. And you look at the type 2 in gray, see these alarming results, two events per person per year on average, which is far higher, frankly, than a number of different studies previously published, including the HAT study, which I think was also conducted here some years ago. Now, of course, it's important to remember that events per person per year are slightly misleading because it's an average. We know that many individuals have none, and some individuals have a lot. So one way, a uh, different way of pre presenting the data is to look at the proportion who have uh, had at least one episode. That is the graph on the right. If you look on that, events uh, rates are still very alarming. Uh, overall, over a third of the population has experienced a severe episode in the type ones. Over 50% have experienced an episode in type 2 diabetes, approximately a third. Uh, of course, these are people with type 2 on insulin. I should emphasize that, but nevertheless, it shows that the burden of hypoglycemia remains extremely high. Now, an important relationship between severe hypoglycemia and other causes are whether people are aware of hypoglycemia. This can be measured in a, a variety of different 
scales the clerk devised in S, gold devised in Edinburgh in Scotland, all have slightly different questions. And there's a newer questionnaire called the Hypo AQ that is available in both a short and long form. Again, looks in much more, much more detailed way. Uh, and uh, they can all be used to diagnose head awareness and the gold method in particular doesn't take long. Essentially, you, you ask individual uh, on a scale uh, of one to seven, whether they can tell that they're low time or very rarely, and they place their answer along that line. So you can answer, ask that question quickly. And importantly, there's a reasonable correlation relationship between subjective measures of awareness as measured by these scales, symptoms, which you can measure during uh, experimental hypoglyce hypoglycemic clamp, although the most accurate correlation, whether or release epinephrine, adrenaline, during hypoglycemic. So uh, there is a connection, perhaps not as close as you would like, but you reliant on these methods. Now, awareness of hypoglycemia decreases the longer you have. That's absolutely been shown in type 1 diabetes. We have a prevalence in the whole type 1 population of 1 in 5, 20%. Uh, and those have impaired awareness significantly older. They've had diabetes for longer, and importantly, uh, there's a very strong relationship between their awareness state and uh, the frequency of severe events that they experience. Indeed, in type 1 diabetes, around sixfold. If you look at the graph on the right, which I conducted uh, a study conducted in Scotland some years ago, the longer you have diabetes, uh, the greater your risk uh, impaired awareness and indeed hypoglycemia. So it's duration, which is a really important contributing factor, as well as having had an episode over the previous 12 months. Now, uh, we've always known that duration had an effect, but it was only, it's only, well, in the early 90s, we and others uh, undertook studies to show quite why that was happening. In this really simple study, we uh, took a group of people without diabetes uh, and we brought them in and tested their responses to the hypoglycemia using a clump. We measured their uh, adrenaline responses at 2.5 millimoles per liter, 45 milligrams per deciliter, uh, and their symptom scores. Uh, and we showed that these people who did not have diabetes had a very brisk hypoglycemic response. Uh, on the morning of the first study. Then we, in the afternoon, we brought them back and subjected them to two hours, slightly less severe hypoglycemia, around 50 per deciliter. Then we sent them on their way and brought them back the next morning. You can see that these two events, because of course the test was an episode of hypoglycemia and the two hours have produced dramatic changes in their ability defend themselves against hypoglycemia, a uh, halving of their adrenaline, uh, and a marked reduction in symptom scores. And these uh, kind of studies have now been repeated. One and type 2 diabetes show undoubtedly that repeated episodes of hypoglycemia, and this is particularly likely in people who are, are aiming for tight glucose control, uh, are going to get impaired defenses to hypoglycemia, particularly, and this is very important, that in type 1 diabetes, you lose your most powerful somatic defense to hypoglycemia, the ability to release glucagon during hypoglycemia. Uh, and so you're very dependent on the response to the sympathoadrenal nervous system to protect you. So impaired awareness of hypoglycemia is fundamentally important affects around a quarter of those with type 1, and recent studies have shown around 
10% of insulin treated type 2 uh, have the same problem reducible by exposure to hypoglycemia as i've just demonstrated it's reversible uh, and i haven't time to show you these studies in detail but if you can avoid all glucose levels below around 55 grams deciliter for around six weeks, then you can restore at least those with relatively short duration um, hypoglycemia, and it's relevant. Type one, it increases the risk of severe episodes sixfold, whereas in type twos, it's probably even more important, around 15 times greater risk uh, who have impaired awareness. So very important that those of you looking after insulin treated patients with type 2 diabetes try and establish they have or not. The simple way that I've suggested because it will identify those. Now, you can reverse it. I mentioned one study conducted by my friend and colleague Stephanie Emil in Cranston led the study from King's College Hospital in London. They took 12 men with impaired awareness type 1 diabetes. But they worked very hard to prevent hypoglycemia in just three weeks. And when they did that, they reversed impaired awareness. Three. And this slide shows results of the experiments they did to show why that had happened. You'll note they measured cognitive function during the clamp, uh, which was done with a four-choice reaction time test, a very simple test delivered actually electronically. Uh, and you can see that the threshold for impaired cognitive function shown on the right changed between the pre and post periods prevention of hypoglycemia. It was running around uh, about 50 deciliter. The symptom uh, threshold at which, the glucose at which the threshold symptoms appeared uh, started around 45 milligrams per deciliter, but at the end of the period had risen to around 55, 56. And you can see that's above threshold impaired cognitive function. And I hope that explains quite clearly and recover their awareness. So for the final bit of my talk, I just want to talk a bit about um, how we can address this in real life. What can we do? Well, we can use better insulins. And this really important study, uh, which was conducted in Denmark um, by Pedersen Bergard and colleagues, uh, was undertaken to compare insulin analogs with human insulin. Uh, they persuaded these individuals with type 1 diabetes who were at risk of hypoglycemia spend a year using human insulin, then switched to being analog insulin. Uh, and it was a crossover, randomized crossover trial, uh, and they measured the number of hypoglycemic events. Uh, you can see on this slide the number of severe episodes broken down in time of day and night. They showed a, a significant risk reduction when these individuals were using Analog insulin, they reduced severe hypoglycemia 0.5 severe episodes per patient per year, which was equivalent to a 30% risk reduction. Uh, and if you look at the bottom, you can see the timing of the severe events when they were taking human insulin and analog insulin. And the important takeaway message is that using analog insulin reduces the risk of severe hypoglycemia at night. Important observation, which uh, stands till this day. Now, the other problem with conventional delivery of insulin is that rapid-acting insulin, even with analogs, does not work fast enough. And it's quite challenging, and particularly in type 1 diabetes, to encourage patients to leave a gap between injecting and eating, uh, which should be 30 minutes. I wonder how many audience recommend to their patients they should be leaving a gap of at least 30 minutes. In pregnancy, we say 45 minutes. 
And the advent of continuous glucose monitoring has shown very clearly that if patients not leave this kind of a gap, they can't match their food to their insulin, and they will see these very sharp rises glucose after eating. It's probably the biggest help to show how people could, if possible, use their insulin. So, of course, it's not practical. But I just want to show you this, uh, this slide, which is data from uh, a study we published some years ago, that inhaled insulin. Was, and you can see that when people used failed insulin, which works within a few minutes, they could reduce the rate of hypoglycemia, both level uh, one and two. So um, there is a place for inhaled insulin. Of course, there have been safety issues, and it's not generally available. But because it works so quickly, uh, is um, a promising insulin, I think, and it shouldn't be totally discarded. What about technology? And I just want to show you um, a couple of slides which looks at CGM and hybrid closed loop. This is the um, in-control crossover study uh, undertaken in Europe, published in 2016. Again, it was a crossover study. They looked at biochemical hypoglycemia in people using continuous glucose monitoring. <clears throat> and you see that uh, when people were using uh, CGM compared to blood glucose monitoring, they could reduce their rates of hypoglycemia uh, at all different glucose levels. And if we looked at severe hypoglycemia on the right, when they did, they showed marked reduction in events needing third-party assistance, not quite such a big difference in severe resulting in coma or or admission, but nevertheless, because of course people with type 1 tend to treat their events uh, at home and, don't, and often don't come into hospital, this quite marked reduction, I think, makes the case TGM in people who are at risk of severe hypoglycemia and those in impaired awareness. And importantly, they were seen quite uh, no change in hypoglycemia awareness. And that is the theme. I'm going to return to. This is um, an early hybrid closed loop study, the SMILE trial, 153 participants, again, in type 1 diabetes. They showed a, a marked reduction in severe events, although there were very few. I think there was three events in the, when using the hybrid closed loop uh, and around 15 events in total with those uh, on uh, CSII controls, but if you look at the number of hypoglycemic episodes here, which were less severe, uh, still a marked reduction. Again, no significant change of impaired awareness, and I want to contrast that. The HypoCompass study led by Jim Shaw from Newcastle, we were in sites where this was undertaken. It was a factorial design comparing conventional therapy of blood glucose monitoring against pumps and CGM, and some patients with pumps and CGM. And these were all individuals with frequent hypoglycemia and impaired awareness. Now, importantly, you can see when we look at blinded that we were reducing the time below uh, 54 milligrams deciliter as the study went on. Uh, there was a marked reduction in severe episodes during 12 months, uh, the first six months of the study, again, as you can see here. And uh, the intervention, which was common to all the groups, was brief education and afternoon education, followed by a weekly phone call from a healthcare professional. And it made no difference whether they were on pumps or real-time seat. Uh, and so a good evidence that you could reduce hypoglycemia, but really importantly, educational intervention uh, also reduced the number with impaired awareness. If you look at these results, you can see around 80% of those uh, had recovered their awareness in a few years. So there's something different between an educational intervention and technology. And frankly, we just don't know. Uh, 
uh, and I've mentioned education. I want to emphasize how effective it is. This is a study from Germany published by Michael Berger and his colleagues looked at a week's training of structured education, uh, teaching people how to avoid hypoglycemia amongst giving them the skills to manage. And in the year before they underwent the training, exponential rise in severe events with falling HbA1c, which was abolished here following the education. There's something about education and teaching people to use their insulin safely uh, is very important. And in many respects, is more, a lot more cost effective than technology. Yet very few people seem uh, to uh, have to undergo this. It's extraordinary. We have brought the German work to the UK uh, and devised a uh, uh, a translated version called Daphne. Again, uh, we have shown clearly that people who undergo the education in an observational study have less impaired awareness. Uh, they recover their awareness and less events of hypoglycemia. And so again, really strong suggestion that we should be providing this across all countries because it's cheap. There's been a meta-analysis, which is a bit out of date now. In fact, the International Hyperglycemia Study Group are about to uh, update this. They've looked at educational, technology, and pharmacological interventions, and that they've shown that educational intervention is effective, improved awareness. On the whole, technology does not improve awareness, uh, and insulins, uh, not much evidence, but they usually exclude with hypoglycemia. Uh, and one recent uh, hybrid closed loop study again showed uh, reduced hypoglycemia, time below risk, failing to deliver uh, an increase um, in awareness. So, uh, what else do we have to offer? Well, there's a really interesting study just published, led by, again by Stephanie Emil. We participate in this. The heart doc intervention, people who were on technology still experiencing hypoglycemia were participants in this study uh, across the UK, three different centers, one in the uh, in Boston at the Jostling Clinic. Uh, educators were trained by clinical psychologists, and the aim was to look at cognitions, things that people thought about, which we think uh, increased their risk of severe hypoglycemia. Uh, and this was just one example. They thought, well, nothing terrible will happen to me. I should be much more worried about high glucoses. And the educators were trained to address these using CBT motivational technique. Um, and here are the results. BGAT is a longstanding uh, intervention which teaches people to be much more aware of reasons, probably than repeat hypoglycemia. And if we're going to make a, a difference and understand this, we need to define phenotypes much better. We need bigger populations to study and conduct our interventions in large numbers. Uh, and the National Institute of Health, US, has uh, decided to fund a very large study. Uh, it started in the uh, autumn of last year, it's going to go on for five years. It includes centers in the US, UK, and Australia. Uh, and it's going to look at a, a very large clinical trial to see if we can understand what is effective and indeed what is not. So hopefully uh, in three or four years' time, we'll be able to answer at least some of the questions. So my conclusions, uh, ladies and gentlemen, after 100 years of insulin, hypoglycemia remains a barrier, preventing people for achieving glycemic control, uh, I would argue that large multi-center trials, uh, as I've just said, requiring uh, measurement of counter-regulatory hormones, in other words, experimental studies on top of the uh, large-scale intervention are needed to try and understand what's going on, most important, to identify the things which can make a difference. 